Good afternoon. My name is Ayana Sanders, and today I have the great honor of introducing our Class Day speaker, former United States Attorney General Loretta E. Lynch. It is a special honor as a black woman, and a fellow member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, to be granted the privilege of providing this introduction. Loretta Lynch obtained her undergraduate degree from Harvard University in 1981. She then went to obtain her JD from Harvard Law School in 1984. After finishing out her time at this university, Lynch launched a legal career fervently dedicated to defending civil rights. Loretta Lynch began her career in private practice with Cahill, Gordon, and Rendell. In 1990, she left private practice and joined the United States Attorney's Office with the Eastern District of New York as an assistant U.S. Attorney. Over the next 10 years, Lynch held a variety of roles within the United States Attorney Office, including Deputy Chief of General Crimes, Chief of the Long Island Division, and Chief Assistant for the U.S. Attorney. Finally, in 1999, she was appointed the U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of New York. After 2002, Lynch returned to private practice before assuming the role of U.S. Attorney once again for the Eastern District of New York in 2010. In this position, Lynch remained determined to take on pivotal civil rights cases that advanced justices, even in those cases where they were deemed controversial. In 1997, she served as a member of a trial team in the U.S. versus Volpe case, which convicted NYPD officers for the assault and torture of Abner Luima, a Haitian migrant. The case was and continues to be a rare example of the government holding police officers in America accountable for their actions. Her tenure also included the prosecution of various cases for terrorism, cybercrime, and tax evasion, all while strenuously defending civil rights. Lynch served as the U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of New York for five years until President Barack Obama appointed her as the 83rd Attorney General of the U.S. Department of Justice in 2014. Loretta Lynch was the first black woman to assume this role. In this role, Lynch built off the work of her predecessor to continue to fight for people's rights. Under her authority, the Justice Department filed a lawsuit to invalidate North Carolina's bathroom bill, which, if enacted, would have effectively violated the rights of transgender individuals. During her tenure, the department also conducted investigations of police brutality across the nation. Lynch made sure that her time within the department was spent, quote, defending vulnerable victims, people who didn't have anyone to speak up for them, end quote. She accomplished this goal by approaching each situation with a sense of fairness and even-handedness. Her appointment as Attorney General of the U.S. Department of Justice came to an end in 2017. Currently, Lynch continues her legal practice as a partner in Paul Weiss, Rifkin, Wharton, and Garrison LLP's litigation department. It is fitting that in this remarkable year, first for women, and especially for black women, our class day speaker is Loretta E. Lynch, a trailblazer in many regards. As the granddaughter of a sharecropper who helped black people flee from the Jim Crow South and relocate up north, and the daughter of a Baptist minister and a librarian, Loretta Lynch continues to surpass her ancestors' wildest dreams. Women like her are trailblazers, and they are proof that despite all the obstacles that society unfortunately sets in front of you, you can still accomplish great things. It is powerful black women like Loretta Lynch who inspired me to go to law school, who motivate me to keep moving forward on my rough days and continue to show me that no door is close to my dreams. With that being said, please join me in giving a warm welcome to our 2022 Class Day speaker, Loretta E. Lynch. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Okay. Thank you so much for that warm introduction and for that warm welcome. Dean Manning, Dean Ball, President Mann of the Association, the outstanding award recipients, all of you in front of me and on the stage with me, the class of 2022, all of you. And let me also say a warm welcome to, frankly, the most important people here today, the family and the friends who have supported you 
and got you here to this moment. Thank you so much for that warm welcome. I'm so glad to be here with all of you. Also, Dean Manning, I want to thank you for mentioning the loss we suffered just yesterday in Uvalde, Texas. I know that many of us have those events on our mind. Our hearts are broken once again over the lives cut short by the senseless act of violence. And as we focus on this tragic loss, let us also focus on action to deal with the curse of violence that seems to hang over us. And I can think of no better group to see this issue from all sides as you've been taught here at the law school and work to save us from this darkness. But as for today, today I am profoundly glad that we have found our way back to each other and that we are here together in person. Now, as varied and diverse as this class is, I believe I could probably speak for all of you when I note that the past three years were not the law school experience that you would imagine that they would be. Almost two-thirds of your time was virtual, including both of your summers. Many of you will soon begin working for people that you likely have never met in person, but you persevered and we're here. You did not let this pandemic keep you from your amazing work on Harvard's journals and its wonderful clinics. Close to my heart, the home of my 2L year, of course, was the Legal Aid Bureau, which has for, for over 50 years has been dispensing justice to the Harvard community. But let me tell you, to see the expansion of the opportunity to plunge into the real work of representing clients and crafting law and policy has been so wonderful to see over the years. Now, I also know that I'm not alone when I say that the isolation of the past two years was actually harder than we initially thought, or we've really begun to comprehend. The stresses are magnified, anxieties are increased. All of that is added to the inherent challenges of law school itself. Now, it's no wonder that while you are still intensely and deservedly happy, Many of you may also be feeling a little bruised, a little battered, maybe even still a little shell-shocked. And this can be very dispiriting, particularly at this happy time. But as we leave what we fervently hope is the final winter of our discontent, know this, you have developed a resilience, the depths of which you have yet to plumb, and a resolve that you didn't have before the strength of which will surprise you when you begin to draw down upon it. And you will have need of it. I say this because to say that you were graduating into challenging times is in fact to utter a profound understatement. In addition to the crushing pandemic, the last three years seem to encompass the apotheosis of generations of issues into their triad. Just two years ago today, Literally today, the world watched in horror as George Floyd lost his life under the knee of a uniformed Minneapolis police officer. It was a shocking crime. It was a senseless tragedy. It did not have to happen. And for those of us who have worked on police reform over the years, it stood as a literal rebuke to all of our efforts. And I know that many of you struggle to make sense of a legal system where the ultimate symbol of protection to so many is also an inherent symbol of fear to so many others. An outpouring of rage and pain filled our hearts and our streets, not just here, but around the world. And when the equally shocking and unnecessary deaths of Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery came to light as further symbols of our country's refusal and I use that word deliberately, as this is a choice that is made over and over again, not to deal with the original sin that begat the systemic racism woven into the fabric of our society, our hearts further exploded. But something happened this time. As people marched and spoke, they were joined by a broad swath of humanity, both in this country and around the world, 
we actually came together in an epiphany of understanding and empathy that began to fuel what we hoped was systemic change. And we saw the possibility of change that recognized the costs of pernicious racism, not just to its immediate victims, but to all of us. And we began to explore its roots and its branches in an effort to understand why we continue to let a distinction without a difference repeatedly tear us apart. And with this awakening, there began to be a reckoning. But now, as your time at the law school draws to a close, you are entering a world that has seen a dizzying reversal of so many of those efforts. When we look outside this beautiful field, we see a world where authoritarianism seeks to rise again. There is a war in Eastern Europe, raising the specter of the global disintegration of peace. And here, here, in the greatest democracy in the world, we see the culmination of years of efforts to curtail the fundamental right to vote, the birthright of every citizen. And here, in a country founded on individual liberty, we're about to see the reversal of the individual's right to make one of the most private and consequential decisions of their lives on their own. And just, just as we have begun to face our complicated and painful history, we see efforts to suppress emerging truths, to literally erase the trials and tribulations that we've overcome to get to where we are in an apparent attempt to, pay, to spare some people discomfort. Yes, discomfort. Because apparently here, in the greatest country in the world, we can conquer space, we can work with subatomic particles, we can cure broad groups of cancers, but we cannot handle discomfort. Really? In America? And where did this inexplicable and hitherto completely unknown desire to be the snowflake of the world come from? Where? Discomfort is not the enemy. Discomfort is the spur towards change. Discomfort is the push towards greatness. And let me say this, we will never truly appreciate our achievements, and they are many, if we do not know what we overcame to gain them. They will never be ours to hold. Why would we keep that from ourselves? We are better than that. We are stronger than that. The tragic events of Buffalo just last week have showed us the perils of forgetting our history. Again, tragic, tragically, lives lost to racism. Not just those killed and struck down by the bullets, but the life of a perpetrator who descended down a rabbit hole of ignorance and fear that has him lost as well. We pay a price when we don't remember. Discomfort? And I'm here to tell you, in any event, comfort is overrated. <laughs> comfort keeps you complacent. Comfort keeps you malleable. Comfort keeps you in stasis. Comfort does not let you move forward. And here's what else I know. All of you, the class of 2022, JD, SJD, and LLM, you did not come to Harvard Law School to be comfortable. You came here to make a difference. All of you, you did not leave your other careers, you did not leave your other countries, you didn't leave your families to be comfortable. You came here to make a difference. You didn't work on journals, looking at issues from all sides, exploring the limits of the law to be comfortable. You did that to make a difference. You didn't work in Harvard's legal clinics, representing real people with real problems to be comfortable. 
You did that to make a difference. You didn't create your own programs and expand your mind and your horizons with classes both traditional and cutting edge to be comfortable. You did that to make a difference. All of the work that we've heard about from all of these wonderful young people who won these prizes, I know they represent the larger class here. None of that was done for your comfort. You did it to make a difference. Now I know that it can be hard to, to see how to continue to make that difference when you look around at the noise and the divisions of today. What I want to share with you is it is important, it's vital to see those repressive efforts for what they truly are. A backlash to generations of progress and to real change that was beginning to take hold. It's part of the larger pattern of progress and pain that has been found within our country for generations. And by seeing this pattern, we can see how we overcame the armies of repression before and how we can do it again. Because we have been here before. And in times of great tragedy, in times of great pain, in times of great challenge, we have turned to the law to work through all of these issues. We've lived this pattern of great progress and the resultant fear and violence that often erupts. We've seen how power consolidates to try and slam shut the doors that we have forced open. This backlash has always followed, as night follows day, as Jim Crow followed Reconstruction. Why is it so strong today? Why is it so intense now? Because the strength of any backlash is directly proportional to the power it seeks to suppress. The power of the change that we have seen will not stop because real progress is being made. And as we look out at today's efforts to limit and to even crush our democracy, to curtail our public discourse and to ignore how far we have truly come, the lesson to take from this is that the pendulum has swung this way before and it likely will again. The lesson to learn is not that we've lost that fight, but that our gains have struck a recurring dissonant chord. It's not that our values and our efforts are not true and enduring, but that it falls to every generation to defend them in their own time. It's that the price of freedom is constant vigilance, and this price falls to everyone, and now it's our turn. History shows us that some of our greatest advances have come after periods of intense opposition. We see those seeds even now. In Eastern Europe, the war in Ukraine has united and solidified that country like never before. The mouse that roared has stood up to the Russian bear and inspired the world. Our recent pandemic has inspired a generation of future healers and the push to erode human and civil rights has inspired a new generation of activists, many of whom I dare say are here today, who refuse to sit back and be comfortable. So the question is, how will all of you, the class of 2022, make your difference? Well, you've actually already begun to do so. First, let me thank you for choosing the law. Because in thoughtful and caring hands, the law has been the instrument of change, great and small, for generations. Next, you chose to come here to Harvard Law School. You chose a place that would push you and challenge you and change you so that you could change the world. And then through your own grit and determination, you've made it to this point. And you weren't silent along the way. You spoke up, you spoke out, and you pushed this institution further along its own path to greatness. You've already made a difference. You already know that the beautiful diversity within this country is one of its greatest strengths, not a weakness. 
you already know that we are stronger when all voices are heard and valued. Because the truth is, we still spend far too much time in our respective silos of opinion and silos of different news. Outside these hallowed halls, we talk at each other and not with each other. And when we don't achieve instant agreement, we decry each other's intelligence or their patriotism or even humanity. And know that I am not limiting this point to any one side or perspective. Now more than ever, we need emissaries of the law to reach across our aisles of disagreement and connect with the different sides of our debate. Harvard Law School class of 2022, you are the change we've been waiting for, but no pressure. <laughs> now your challenge now is to find your own path outside these hallowed halls. And this too is a challenge that we've all faced. Please trust me when I tell you that you have everything you need to continue to make that difference. Now that may not be in focus now as you begin your journey through this wonderful profession of ours. And you'll continue to wonder over the course of your career, whether you're poring over documents or working on a settlement agreement or trying to finance a business. But know this, your time here has prepared you, not just for your first job in the law, but for your last one and for all the moments in between when your time to make a difference will arise. Now I have to tell you, it was truly an honor to serve as the Attorney General of the United States. I was privileged to lead the Department of Justice to expand civil rights for all, to protect this nation from terrorism, and I was able to work on criminal justice reform. Our focus was to protect the most vulnerable among us, from those suffering elder abuse to those caught up in the scourge of human trafficking. And I was able to travel this great country to work on improving the relationship between law enforcement and the communities they serve. And it was also wonderful to work with a fellow Harvard Law School alum and our first African-American and truly great president. I'll never forget that. But some of my favorite moments from my time at the Department of Justice were never in the spotlight. They were from my days as a young lawyer, helping a frightened witness find the courage to testify, sitting with the families of those lost to gang violence and being able to bring them some small measure of justice. Those are the times I've ended up holding closest to my heart. And if I can leave you with but one thought today, let it be this. It's not the title that you will eventually hold, but the people that you touch that will make the biggest difference, not just in this world, but in your life. And know this, that as you leave here to make your difference in the world, you have the grounding of this great school, you have the love and the support of your families, and you have the faith of all of us who welcome you into this wonderful profession of ours. And as you've already seen, the work to make a difference is both vital and enduring. And it comes about through efforts both large and small. But I'm here to tell you, it also takes time. And the push and pull will sometimes leave you discouraged. When you don't see your results immediately, it can be so tempting to pull back. It's easy to question your efforts. But the reality is, our path to equality has never been straight or even readily visible. It's always had twists and turns and downright reversals. But we push forward because that is how change is made. And when clouds come to cover your path, as they inevitably will, let me commend to you the words of one of my favorite philosophers, the theologian Reinhold Niebuhr. He's best known for the serenity prayer, but I've always found strength in these particular words. Nothing that is worth doing can be achieved in our lifetime. Therefore, we must be saved by hope. Nothing which is true or beautiful or good makes complete sense in any immediate context of history. Therefore, we must be saved 
by faith. Nothing we do, however virtuous, can be accomplished alone. Therefore, we must be saved by love. No virtuous act is quite as virtuous from the standpoint of our friend or foe as it is from our standpoint. Therefore, we must be saved by the final form of love, which is forgiveness. And as all of you embark upon your own path, I wish you hope for the future, faith in your efforts and in your fellow man, love for those around you, and forgiveness for and from our human foibles. Congratulations, my newest colleagues. I cannot wait to see what you will achieve. Thank you, thank you so much.